of the hour. So welcome everybody formally to our webinar, how to simplify customer journeys. Certainly from the number of people we've got logged in already, I think is proving to be a uh, very popular topic. Uh, we've got some brilliant speakers for you all today. So I'd like to first off by introducing Alex Mead. Alex is a customer service experience, leadership and uh, transformation expert, uh, who's uh, been a big friend of call center helper over the years and has got a, a, a long track record in, uh, in helping organizations. Welcome, Alex. Hi, good, good to be here. And you're going to be sharing some of your, some of your thoughts about a sort of, if you like, a system, system, systematic approach to, to I'm customer journey. I'm going to be um, making people hopefully think differently to the, the most common noise we hear. And it's not thoughts, it's based on experience. So hopefully that people will be able to take tangible things out of what I share. Wonderful. I'm also delighted to welcome to our first webinar with us, uh, Annika Bjork, who's a customer uh, centricity expert and uh, also a lecturer in customer service. And Annika, you're going to be, um, so w welcome, you, and you're going to be talking us through some of the thoughts about the, the, the way that uh, process and design can help. Yeah, exactly. On um, how you can streamline the delivery chain behind your um, customer journey and your moments of truth. Well, wonderful. And uh, welcome back to Mike Murphy from Genesis. Welcome. Welcome back, Mike. And you're going to be looking at the, the whole way that uh, technology can help to, to play a, an angle within the, within the whole customer journey. Indeed, I am, Jotty. Uh, thanks for inviting me again. And uh, great to be here. And uh, great to be here with the, um, the new panel. Um, for sure, my, my, um, my topics really are around um, the role of technology in, 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 if you like, the journey mapping, but how easy it is, if you will, to, to kind of get very fragmented and very disjointed. Um, so from that perspective, um, some learnings that I've had in my own experience and uh, with the experience of some of my customers that I wanted to share with you today. Wonderful. Well, we're going to be uh, doing a bit of housekeeping now. If you want to watch a replay of today's webinar, there's a lot of detail we're getting through today, uh, particularly in uh, Alex's uh, slides. There's a lot. So if you want to share this with your management team or with your leadership team, uh, it's quite good to do that. We'll have that available for about 45 minutes after the webinars ended. That's at callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. Uh, if you want to get a copy of slides, then the best place to do it is to jump into our chat room where we have the discussion. I think we've got about 155 people online as we speak, but only 60 of you are logged into the chat room. So now is the time to go to the chat room. Very easy. You can either just go to callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat, uh, or a really quick way is just to type into your browser, put cch.chat into, uh, into the browser, and that's effectively a speed dial straight into the chat room. Just need to put in your first name and email address. It does come up in a separate window, so either go into the chat room on your phone, uh, just put in this little code cch.chat into your browser, uh, or you can put it into a separate window. But, you know, if you've got a big PC, have the chat room on one side, the webinar slides on the other is the best way to do it. And when you're logged in, uh, you'll see this button here that says download webinar slides. So you can click onto that. You can uh, connect to uh, download uh, Alex's, Annika's and Mike's slides from there. If you want to connect to uh, Alex, Annika or Mike on uh, LinkedIn, you can certainly uh, do that, and I'm sure they'd uh, love to uh, love to connect with you. So, uh, which I think would uh, work well. Uh, we've got an added advantage thing in the, in the chat room uh, that you can ask questions or you can leave tips. We've got a, a prize for the best tip. It's either a bottle of champagne, a box of chocolates, or or a gift card if you prefer that. Uh, so, but it, if you could just help us by, if it's a question, could you just put hashtag question? Uh, in front of the question. And if it's tip, just use hashtag tip while you're in the chat room. And again, the uh, link to go into the chat room, just type in uh, cch.chat into your browser or into your mobile phone. And then you can, uh, you can join us from there, which I think would, uh, would fit in very well. Right, so we've now got uh, about 170 online and 93 people logged, logged into the chat room. So that address cch.chat. What we're now going to do is we're now going to start a quick
poll and I just wanted to find out what tools that it is that you use to analyze customer journeys. Just select all of those that uh, apply. Uh, so do you use things like post-it notes to analyze customer journeys? I certainly see a lot of that in journey mapping. Do you use a whiteboard or pen? Do you go through things like call recordings? Do you go through screen recordings? Do you have a dive through the call detail records, which are the, the things that the uh, telephone systems um, throw out? Do you go, if you've got some sort of online sharing platform that you, you put in like Slack, uh, do you use something like Excel to plan out your customer journeys? Or do you have any specialist customer journey uh, planning software? So just like to put into the, um, uh, put in which tools it is that you use to do the uh, uh, journey. Um, let's see if, if uh, our uh, uh, tools expert, Mike Murphy has got any, uh, any predictions for which one of, is likely to be the most, uh, uh, most common one here? Well, in the, in the days of conferences and um, uh, you're getting, getting a bunch of colleagues around a table, the post-it notes was always the, the, the classic favorite um, and uh, building swim lanes around the conference room and laying out the journeys there. So that was always helpful. But um, certainly if you are going deeper into the tech, then um, yeah, I'm kind of curious about the, the specialist customer journey software. That sounds interesting. <laughs> so let's have a let's have a look on on the, what people have put. Well, the most common one of them all is um, call recordings. Okay. Uh, quite a number of people do go through the call detail records, which I think are absolutely fascinating. Uh, if you're not familiar with call detail records, uh, they're quite easy to to get hold of. It's buried in your um, in your in your telephone system. Uh, reports, you can typically get them out and um, uh, very, very good for sampling. You see who the calls, you know, you look individual lines, it can go into a spreadsheet. You can look at how many calls were transferred, who they were transferred from. You can build patterns of who's called back. So if you're a bit of an Excel geek, there's enough there to um, almost justify another job for yourself uh, on that, So, uh, which is great. So. Yeah, so some fascinating, uh, fa fascinating results, uh, results in there. Alex, not a lot of people using post-it notes or whiteboard and paper there. So presumably a lot of people are not, um, not mapping the customer journey currently. The, um, we use a thing called Miro, Miro board. I don't know if you know it, it's the same equivalent. So it's a virtual post-it note in effect. But uh, yeah, I'm a great believer in listening to what customers say, looking why cases are raised, rather than doing a whole bunch of journey mapping, just look at what customers are telling you. You, you get more, much more. Indeed. Well, probably a good time to jump across to Alex Mead now. And Alex, if you'd like to share your thoughts on uh, how to uh, improve customer journeys. Okay. Uh, everyone can see my screen okay, I hope? We can indeed. Right. Um, I'll start the clock. He's very tight with his timekeeping, Jonty. So uh, 30 slides in 10 minutes, go. So how to simplify customer journeys. Um, or as I'd like to call it, oops, how to deliver epic customer service experiences. So I'll come on to that. Um, so the common approach, the thing we nearly all experience with most companies we interact with is uh, there's been a lot of focus in the last five years taking disparate channels and making a linear path straight from A to B. And that's what people thought was the way to simplify things. So typically you see a chatbot. The chatbot is sometimes so clever you can speak to it, natural language chatbot. That doesn't work, so you then get into an agent chat session, who then will quite often tell you they can't help you, you need to phone the call center. And you may well be answered by a natural language speech recognition call center engine. By the time it arrives at the agent, they have no idea of the five steps you've taken so far. Um, and then the company may stick some sentiment analysis in. Let's see which customers were happy or unhappy. And worse still, let's send a survey, even though we know damn well we've not helped that customer in any shape or form. So that's the standard approach. It, it, it can work in the right way, but what that approach means for most customers is we're forced into badly designed chatbot channels, not all the time, but a lot, really lengthy agent chat sessions. I've had some that take an hour, the equivalent of a two minute phone conversation. We've all had long call center queues, COVID or not. Uh, we have to repeat information over and over. By the time you put the phone down or finish the chat session, you hope and pray, did that agent actually do something with what I've asked them to do? So you chase up two or three days later and you're finally asked to ask for feedback when it's really, you really should not be asking me for feedback at the moment. So basically we're forced to give up. So 
this is a feeling I'm sure many of us have had after we've had a conversation across many channels. And sometimes we've even had this feeling, but hey, it's, uh, it's life. So um, I'm not gonna dwell on this side, but there's so much noise and confusion. Experienced practitioners, solution providers, industry commentators, they tell you all of this, these are the things you need to do. Wow, this is just too much. It's, it's confusing. And that's why most customer experience transformations get stuck. So before I give you my opinion, here's um, CX industry veterans. I, I don't know who an industry veteran is, but I, I assume it's the, the usual people we all hear from. Customer service focuses on problem solving so customers can get the best, best out of your service. Customer experience looks at the overall impression across every aspect of your journey. We don't disagree with that, but my customer experience is probably made up 80% plus of my customer service experience. And if I have a problem with anything, the brand, the product, the delivery, I'm going to be contacting customer service. So I've had a long opinion for a long time. We should focus on a thing called customer service experience, which has three facets to it. Creating the very best customer contacts options across all channels for all customer requests, pre-sales, sales, support, delivery at all times. But it also has to focus not just great channels, resolving all these customer service and requests in the very best way. I say the best way because for different customers, it's different ways. And finally, the, a point a lot of people forget is the CSX drives change throughout the whole business. When customers have an issue, who do they talk to? Customer service. I think a lot of people think of customer service as a complaints department. No, it's every interaction with your business. So here's how I approach simplifying customer journeys. Make sure you understand the stages, the five stages or, or whatever stages there are, and give every customer their own personalized journey within that. Some people may prefer to do the steps that I showed you at the start. Others just want to help themselves. So you've got to make it easy, personalized, intuitive, and contextual. That does say contextual, trust me, something happened with the graphic there. So epic. And I didn't come up with the term epic. I realized the four phrases I was doing came out with epic when I eventually rolled this out over 10 years ago. So what does epic CSX mean for your customers? It's easy to find where you can get help. I sometimes spend ages trying to find even where do I find the help page. And when you do, you have the choice of, do I want to help myself or do I want to talk to an agent straight away? I can choose my channel. I can choose if I want to wait in a call center queue or a chat session or have you call me back or send a message. I want a seamless journey. I never want to repeat a thing that you should already know or I've already told one of your colleagues. The process is, need to be customer centered. And by that, I mean, how many times can you say to an agent, okay, can I leave it with you? Can you phone me back in a couple of hours? Very rare, that's not a customer process. You need to, as a customer, have full insight on the stuff the company is working on on your behalf. Don't make it a secret. Let a customer track at all stages how you're working on things. And finally, sorry, not finally, but ultimately, the ability to provide, provide feedback when I as a customer want, not just when you send me a survey. And then I, as a customer, to be able to choose, do I want you to follow up on my feedback? So that's what Epic CSX means. Some, some wonderful quotes here. I won't dwell on them, but um, I just love these, these three people. The, the dear late Tony S.A., Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson. You can't argue with them, and they all believe customer service is the most important aspect of customer experience. So Epic. I'm not gonna go through what I've done. This is an example of what I'm doing in my current role in a bank. We came up with nine stages and we there's so much detail behind these. So you need to detail your customer contact vision against your Epic CSX principles. How are you gonna be Epic? You don't need to call it Epic, but that equivalent. And then these principles must be the design principles across the whole company. So I, I agreed them for customer service experience and I explained to the marketing team, the UX and product team, you cannot roll out anything to a customer unless it's easy, personalized, intuitive, and contextual. Yeah, there's a lot of conversations, but you, you can't do these things half-heartedly. So that's, that's theory. Now here's three real-world examples. So I worked for a, a golf travel company. Um, we had a transformation program. We came up with a transformation name, Project Eagle. Let's not go for a birdie. Let's go for an eagle. Two under par, I'm sure many of you know. So it was called the Epic Transformation. And again, we had 10 stages and I'm happy to share these separately with people, but they're all relevant for your company. So we created a CX, CSX vision against our principles. So this is what it looked like. We had a beautifully designed homepage, booking page, where you can look at your quotations, your bookings, but 
it's a mock-up, it's not the final solution, it's a UX solution, but here's a customer who's looking at two potential quotations. You think about this compared to every travel company you talk to now. They're looking at a package, they want to ask a question, they click help. We know there are six categories for what possible reason a customer could contact us. We know that because we spoke to every contact center agent, we looked at cases and we asked customers. Every question fits into one of these six categories. So this customer has a question about golf facilities. So they've just done click, straight away we can pop up a knowledge article. They've not been forced down any cul-de-sac, but if the knowledge article hasn't helped them, they can then press contact an agent, blam, one click. Then when they press that, they can choose their channel. They can phone us, they can request a callback, send a message or have live chat. It's just one click. And whatever channel they choose, there's no loss of context. So if they request a callback or even phone us, we know this is, Tony wants to talk about golf facilities at La Finca. And um, finally, what I like to do, I always like to think differently as if I'm a customer. Request a callback. When will that callback come? Will it be in the next five minutes, next hour? So we actually allowed a customer to tell us when they would prefer the callback. Clearly we had control of the ranges. You can request a callback at midnight. And our conversion rate, when we called these customers back, went up through the roof. So every decision we make is based on what the customer, we know about the customer in terms of their profile. Have they got a quote? Have they got a booking? Are they high value? What's the interaction history and what's their context? Context, if somebody is asking us if there are golf buggies available at La Finca and they've just arrived at the golf course, we should deal with that more than someone asking it who's going to be playing there next week. So always think about the context. So a couple more things I mentioned. Customers in, in this model can always see the status of any interaction they've had with this. So here's a customer who's made a room upgrade request. It's in progress. They contact us by live chat. At any stage, they can see the status of that. And on the right, here you can see we had two very simple CSAT questions. We ex actually expanded it. But as, when a customer gives us feedback, they can click a button that says, would you like us to follow up on your feedback? Not every customer wants you to follow up, but those that do, you need to follow up. So a very simple process that created a case, we followed up. So that was golf travel. Here's whiskey, a more modern, more mobile, agile journey. Again, a beautifully designed UI experience. Um, we had these categories. One of them was other. So if you can't come up with every category, have another and learn from it. But 90% of customers clicked one of these five categories or they typed in keywords. And we had so many questions from people going to see the Macallan Distillery in Northern Scotland. Uh, can, can I buy whiskey there, but have it delivered so I don't have to carry it around with me? Blam, we gave them a, an answer. But if the answer didn't answer their question, they could just go on to contact an agent through the channel of their choice, the same principle. Here's a more sophisticated journey. So this customer has five bottles of whiskey. They've just had one arrive, a 30 year old bottle, and they're not happy with the cork. The sediment looks a bit dodgy. So they click product inquiry, they're straight away into a chat session. The AI knows, okay, you're, you're talking to us about this sherry oak bottle. The customer says the cork is disintegrating. And within four comments, they've had a bottle, replacement bottle arranged for delivery to them the next day. The reason it's only four comments is AI is linked to CRM to ERP. We know what the customer's issue is. We know the customer profile, the value, the situation. We know the availability of replacement done. That really, there's not a queue, there's not an IVR, there's no repeat information. And honestly, um, it transformed, the vision for that company was amazing. And again, it's epic customer service experience. So I mentioned um, the last stage here, your bottle will be with you tomorrow. So I had the joy in speech marks of working for a company that delivered half a million parcels a day. Parcel delivery, or should we call it parcel roulette, more likely. <laughs> so in this model, um, I wanna explain how the customer service experience fixed the entire company custom experience. So we came up with our CSX vision again. There were more than six stages. These were the core six. And specifically, this was 2011, believe it or not. We, we came up with a vision. We will tell you when you can expect your driver. That didn't happen then. We were the first bit. And when we can't, if you have an issue, you can contact us easily and we'll find a way to deliver. Even now, that second bullet, how easy is it to talk to, to, talk to a parcel delivery company? Almost impossible. So we came up with a nice, attractive looking website, but the website should never be superficial. So in this scenario, a customer would click, I have a question about receiving a parcel. They would then click a real world category. Your tracking information is wrong. You say my parcel has been delivered, I haven't received it. Blam, they've created their own case. They can phone us, but they would nearly always do it digitally. 
But because we linked the digital to the CRM to the driver routes, we could see the green is, I was here all day, your driver didn't arrive in the middle. The most common operational failure was a thing called false carding, where you wait in all day and you get a thing to say, we tried to deliver, nobody came. We knew it, I knew it instinctively, but categorically, we were able to prove it because every customer that raised that issue created a case that was linked to the driver to his GPS route. We could see if he even went to the address. So 113 from Beckton had force carded three times that day already. So we transformed the business to proactively manage every driver that force carded, did get a, an HR discussion and we stamped out force carding and it transformed the parcel delivery sector. You could get proactive notification when your driver's coming. Force carding still happens now, but this is what we did to fix custom experience with a simple customer service process. As you can see, sorry, I should have highlighted it, but these are the, the things I just mentioned. So finally, um, just to bring it to a close, a, a Middle Eastern airline I've been working with, you, you've got to be consistent. You could say, oh, you can't do Epic for everything. So here's a customer who wants to make a claim for a lost bag. So in the journey, they should be able to click. It was this flight, and we should be knowing what time, how many bags did you check in for that flight? How many arrived? Okay, we know we failed. Here's your claim reference done automatically. But again, at any stage, you can call us, request a call back, or click the live chat. It's very consistent. You, you've got to build all the data around the journey. Um, and the last two things I want to finish is, is um, we're really focused. I'm really focusing on social media in my current roles. It needs to be a core CSX channel. Too, still too often we see 10 agents in the corner doing social media where there's 500 in the contact center. It needs to be a direct channel as with all others. And basically everyone, let me tell you, WhatsApp messenger style is here. It's coming. It's what customers want. You need to focus on that. And I'm doing a lot of work with that now. So to summarize, um, you have to create your own company vision for Epic. You don't need to call it Epic. Validate it with your frontline staff and your customers. Make them your company-wide CSX design principles. Push CEO to support you. Build the foundations first, then add on the clever stuff. Don't put a chat box till you're ready with the basics. Only implement the technology platforms that align to your CSX vision in the order you want them to be uh, implemented. And finally, I've done this in, in many sectors. Here's my, my approach. Hopefully you take something for it, but um, that's the end of my section. Thanks, John D. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Alex, some, uh, some great stuff uh, in there. So I just wonder if everyone can uh, just go into the chat room and say what you like best about Alex's uh, presentation. The address for the chat room here is cch.chat or callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. Some great uh, takeaways there. Customer experience is, is the most, uh, sorry, customer service is the most significant part of customer experience. So focus on getting the customer service right. And that then that whole customer experience uh, drives the whole of the rest of the business. Um, make uh, your service EPIC, which stands for easy, personalized, intuitive and contextual. And more important than making your service epic, make sure that you, the rest of the organization doesn't bring in anything for the customer unless it is easy, personalized, intuitive or contextual. Some, some great advice there. And then if you are offering customers to contact you, let the customer choose their choice of channel. And don't forget that a callback could be a very good, uh, very good choice in there. So some great, uh, great stuff uh, coming through there. We're going to now jump across to the chat room and we're going to have a look at uh, uh, what's been what's been coming through there. So uh, Andrew says golfbreaks.com, brilliant site and experience. I now know why, says uh, Andrew. So well done, uh, Alex, you got a, a fan. Um, Eric says, although many talk about journeys, a surprising number of them do not uh, do an analysis of customer journeys outside of the traditional call center reporting. Alex, your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the parcel delivery uh, example was a great, I was actually brought in, Alex, just fix the bloody call centers. We have a 95% abandonment rate, but we had to fix the business to fix the call centers. So sure. there was one day, December the 12th, 2010, just before I joined, we had 108,000 calls in one day. One year later, we had, I think, 18,000 calls and every one of them was responded to within a minute. Indeed. So Mark asked a question, what's the main metric to decide whether callbacks would work for a, for a business? Callbacks seem expensive and more difficult to resource or manage versus normal forecasted uh, incoming calls. Mike, I don't know if you've got a, a, a feeling on callbacks. Yeah, I think, um, and, and 
in a way, Alex kind of touched on it really, because um, if you invite a callback, certainly from a sort of a, a sales sort of focus, and the customer accepts that callback and makes the reservation, um, you know, for your time basically for the agent to work with them, it's a you know it's a great sort of buying signal, right? They kind of they want they want to sort of like talk to you, they want to talk it like meaningfully. And therefore, I don't want to be kind of waiting in a queue to kind of get to somebody, but actually I'll set some time tomorrow to actually um, have that conversation. So in a way, for me, that's a buying signal and um, they're ready for making a commitment. just want to make sure the details are good. Uh, from our perspective internally, we, we kind of treat callback as a channel in its own right. So we kind of measure it, queue it, forecast it. Um, so from that point of view, I think you don't see it as expensive. I think the, the, the return could be there. It's... it's um, yeah, just just uh, don't discount it. It's becoming quite popular. Well, if I can just confirm one aspect. When you click your category, you then offer the channel relevant to that category. So if someone wants to know how they can change the date of the annual bill, you wouldn't offer them a callback. So you right. can be dynamic with the channels you offer. Yeah, Indeed. And callback also works quite well uh, if you've got very spiky demand. So busy one moment, quiet the next, busy the next. If you're constantly flat out, a callback might actually make the whole thing worse because you're actually then it takes more time to get to there so it does work uh, with plasma. let's have a look um mural apparently is a, a quite a good tool to re recreate the impersonal experience uh, which you can find at mural dot uh, dot co so quite a good useful tip there um the question from for alex the data you are representing the customer leaving the contribution of 70 percent where did where's the base for that data uh, I think there were five different sources and that was 2019. If you Google it, um, why, do, why do people leave uh, for customer experience reasons? I forget the exact term, but all these pieces of data you take with a pinch of salt. I always think, okay, myself personally, why do I leave customer service? So always apply this data to your own personal feeling and in your friends and you'll realize it's probably much higher than 70. Okay, well, let's have a look at a, a couple of tips. Uh, if you need to contact someone back, arrange your time. Add it to your diary and copy in someone else in case you're absent. Uh, use detailed notes so it's clear what's been discussed. I think that's uh, one of the things Alex said. Don't leave the process to the, to the customer. Uh, and if you haven't called your own customer service broadcast number, uh, I guess that's the dial-in number in the last two months, uh, call it this afternoon, so I think is, uh, is a great one. One more quick question before we jump to Annika. Uh, customers requesting a follow-up from the customer satisfaction survey, what would that interaction normally be? For instance, percentage of complaints versus recognition. It, Alex, it, you got a feel? I'd, I'd be uh, contradicting myself if I didn't say that when they click they want to follow up, they can then choose how they want us to follow up with them. So they would choose, do you, do you want me to call you back? If so, when's a good time? So an, an angry customer, that's the best chance to save them. So the click, I want to follow up, we then will say, okay, well, how would you like us to follow up with you? When is a good time? And most people um, don't want a phone call follow up. They just want you to recognize that they've given you some feedback. So we had, we had very few that were bothered about a callback, but it was just, okay, can you confirm to me what you're doing about the feedback I've provided? So it, it was actually quite easy to manage, but the, um, the callback and the follow up, they're all part of the same, as Mike would know, the same journey. So if you request a callback or a follow up, it goes into the same platform. So you don't need to put it in Outlook or a piece of paper. It's all part of the same journey. And the follow-up is always linked to the CRM interaction they've had in the first place. So we know what went wrong. Was it the agent? Was it the process, et cetera, et cetera. So it's the root cause is the more important aspect. So wonderful. So I think that uh, ties in well. Well, we're going to jump across now to Annika. And Annika, if you'd like to share uh, your thoughts on uh, how to uh, simplify the, uh, the, the the customer journey, I'll, if I stop sharing, if you could pop your... Uh, Slides up there. Yep, this should work. Um, yeah, can you see my screen? I guess we can indeed. Okay, great, perfect. Um, can I link on? Perfect. I just need to lower this. Okay, great. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and as we heard, um, customer service teams and call centers and all customer. Uh, front-facing teams are actually the centerpiece of um, customer centricity and the customer's experience. So what I've been observing and what you feel uh, in your daily life is this matching what you're doing between this hopefully beautifully streamlined processes um, that your organization is designing 
um, with some smart people and matching them on the other hand with the customer behavior, which is usually not as streamlined um, as the organization would wish. So this puts you in kind of a sandwich position, as I like to call it, um, with the expectation on one hand from the organization to stick to the processes and on the other, on the other side, the customer with, it, with its intuitive behavior and the goal he's uh, trying to reach and his life going on, especially nowadays. And all of this, while you're juggling too many systems, I've been working a lot with uh, insurance companies, and then I see this two or three screens with 20 systems open, trying to find the right place where to, to put the information in because they're not linked to each other, or then there's a manual process and whatever. So you're juggling all of this at the same time, which um, makes the work sometimes very inefficient and puts a lot of pressure on exactly those teams that are delivering the customer's experience. Um, and the question is, how can you release some of that pressure? Um, quickly to myself, um, my name is Annika Bier, and uh, I help companies to truly understand customer behavior and needs on one hand, and then design successful experiences that customers love. But especially, I help organizations to align um, the entire organization to be more customer centric, to deliver customer centric uh, outcomes, processes, products, um, and whatever is needed. So one is the processes that you have from the organization. The other thing putting pressure on you as a team is the cultural part. So there's this expectation of you delivering the customer's experience, the vision that you have maybe as a company, the experience vision, um, whether it's epic or not, um, some companies have this kind of vision and the values and it is expected that you deliver this towards the customer. But at the same time, the culture of the company might be very different. You're not experiencing these values or this experience um, in the contact with your uh, peers and with the teams delivering um, the services to you um, and the deliverables to you. So this is another kind of sandwich position where you kind of have to play a role towards the customer because the, the organization is not authentically what they say they want to be. Um, and nowadays with all the measurements coming in place at all touch points, especially the ones um, customer facing, so the ones that um, are in call center or in sales teams, the expectation of the organization is so high that you deliver on that customer's experience, on those values, but very often the organization doesn't live it. And that puts another um, bunch of pressure on these teams. Now the question is, what can you do to release some of that pressure and give some responsibility back into the organization? One thing you need to know and to understand is which one are your moments of truth. It's only about 20 to 30 percent of your touch points, which are the most important touch points. So analyze those, find out which one are the most important touch points and systematically manage those. This is what you want to do. Usually the expectation is to manage all touch points, but it's usually not possible from a central place to do that. So you have to empower and trust people to do the rest of 70 to 80% of all touch points to be solid customer experiences. But the moments of truth are the ones you want to truly systematically manage. And to do that, um, when you know which one they are, you can also understand the delivery chain behind these touch points and behind those journeys. And that, make, that simplifies those journey, journeys highly. So what is this delivery chain? Imagine um, a box, an empty box being folded somewhere way back in the organization. And then one team after the other puts in their deliverable in this box. So this is how the outcome um, comes to life for the customer. So it goes from one team to the next one. Everyone puts in their bits and pieces. And then it goes to um, a customer facing team, like a call center or maybe sales team, they put in, usually they rearrange the things, put in some other deliverables, a lot of passion, tie a bow, and then give it to the customer. 
So this is what usually happens, but it's not as streamlined as you see it on this slide. It usually looks more um, like this. So an organization is a living organism. People know people. So the beautifully designed and streamlined processes is not what is happening in the organization. That's not reality. Reality is people talk to people, people know way arounds, you have workarounds, um, and especially if you're in an organization of few years, you kind of arrive and have this feeling, oh, I know where to go to get the information I need or the deliverables that I need. And this is how these delivery chains um, form in companies. And looking at these delivery chains, they tell you a lot about the culture of, uh, of an organization. These are two real life examples. The left-hand side is from a very well-organized Swiss train company um, with, this is the delivery chain behind one customer journey and it affects about 12,000 employees. And you see, it's quite well streamlined. There's not too many teams involved and there's not too many arrows, which would be the, the delivery chain. On the right-hand side, you can see that there's a delivery chain for um, a company in financial industry with about 3,000 employees, so a quarter. And you can see how many teams are involved and how many arrows there are between the teams. This says a lot about the culture. It's the typical copy your ass strategy they're working with. Everyone is talking to everyone. Um, no one has the courage to take a decision because the chances are if they make a mistake, they're gonna be scolded. So they want to spread the responsibility to everyone else. So they're not the only one that might have, um, might be affected by management not being happy with decisions that have been, have been taken. And it is actually possible to analyze this entire um, delivery chain and set up a feedback system to see how customer centric are the teams towards each other. So the philosophy behind it or the philosophy that should be there is not only you have a measurement between the customer and the organization, which honestly is the customer to the customer facing team. This is the interaction which is measured. And that's the pressure you're feeling. And in the back, everyone is like, oh, we want to get our bonus at the end of the year. So please, customer facing teams, do your job right so we get our money. But they are just as responsible for that delivery. And they have to be made responsible for it. And you can only do it by spreading that feedback system into the organization and you can measure um, just as the NPS or customer satisfaction score and the values, you can measure what kind of service and what kind of customer centric mindset am I experiencing it in the organization as an internal customer. So it's about thinking as internal customers. Um, and you can even link it to employee engagement service. So that's a very powerful management tool then because you see maybe one team is having a problem um, with themselves. Um, with their dynamics and at the same time they're delivering bad internal services um, and then you know exactly you have to work with that team. The question is what can you do if you're in call center or, call, or customer service team with this is to simply behind the moments of truth try to follow that service chain or that delivery chain try to understand where does that box, it's like reverse engineering, go backwards the entire process, and it's not the design process, I promise you, um, and see who is putting in which deliverable and how is it working and where are the glitches? Because usually at some point, someone, and very often it's the last team before the customer, you have to fix documents or fix processes or fix whatever, because somewhere there was a glitch in the process. And then you want to give that responsibility back into or to that team where it's coming from. So what you can do, for example, is when you know your moment of truth, you understand the delivery chain, collect the feedback with your team and communicate that feedback. If the teams in the organization are customer centric, they're very interest, interested in, um, in this feedback and it's not about blaming and shaming um, those teams. It's just about 
stating the problem, stating what is, um, what is it causing in your team? Is it customers calling back or um, having to fix some documents? I had an insurance company that had to rewrite the bill of the car insurance because customers would just not understand it. So it would have been, it was easier for them to rewrite the bill. Um, and instead of fixing it at the back, it was always the, the customer facing team doing that work, which means a lot of resources lost um, and invested into this kind of work. And when you have this feedback, you can give those information, kind of build your, um, your chain of evidence on how is this delivery coming to you and what are the consequences, what are the costs it is uh, causing and what are your needs um, and your customer needs so they know exactly what needs to be done. So this is the input from my side. Um, so going from the customer journey backwards in the organization and seeing how it comes alive because not a customer journey is beautiful, it's streamlined and usually not the, the processes are beautiful, it streamlines when they come to life. And if you're interested in more on customer centricity, if that's a topic of interest of yours, um, I blog quite a bit. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn, either on my personal profile or as CX Heroes. That's from my side. Thank you so much, Janti, and thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you very much for, for that. In, indeed, some, uh, some great, uh, great feedback there. Uh, we're going to go and take a quiz in a minute. So uh, now's the time to log into the chat room. And uh, that's where the quiz is. And while you're in the chat room, if you could say what you liked best about uh, Annika's uh, presentation. Again, the link here is cch.chat. Some great uh, advice from Annika there. Match the smart people in your contact, uh, in your contact center and your processes with the, with the customer. Um, uh, empower your employees to do the right thing for the customer and work, you know, I think a very important takeaway, what can you do to release the pressure on your teams? Uh, work out the moments of truth and collect uh, feedback and communicate. So um, some, uh, some great feedback overall. So, right, we're gonna start off with the, uh, uh, with the quiz. Uh, if, hopefully you're already logged into the chat room the address callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat or cch.chat. Um, we think we've got 100 people exactly logged in uh, into the chat room as we speak. Uh, you just click on these color coded button, buttons, which are probably at the bottom of your screen. So let's have a look at the uh, first question. And uh, according to an Ale uh, article Alex recently wrote, where should you uh, start with? Where should you begin when you're transforming the customer experience? All of these are important, but which one is the one to start with? Uh, a, capturing and understanding your customer pain points. B, giving your employees a voice. C, setting a customer experience vision. Or D, setting, stepping into your customer shoes. So if you'd just like to jump into one of these, and according to an article Alex uh, recently wrote, uh, where should you begin when transforming your overall customer experience? So uh, I think we've got about uh, 50 of you uh, uh, voted so far, so I'll just uh, let the number go up a little bit and uh, see what the result is. I think that's probably uh, got most of them in there. You can always catch up on the next uh, on the next question. So um, the actual answer, uh, most of you got uh, got wrong. Alex actually suggested that uh, though they're all important, the first thing that you need to do is understand, appreciate, and capture all of the existing customer pinch points, because only once you've got that, can you then move on to the, uh, get the other ones, uh, other ones together. So according to our readers, which is the biggest barrier to making customer experiences easier? Is it lack of communication between departments? Is it slow or outdated technology? Is it failing processes or policies? Or is it a lack of available budget? So A, lack of communication between departments. B, slow or outdated technology. C, failing processes or policies, or D, lack of available budget, which you think is the biggest barrier to making customer experience uh, easier. So um, well, let's have a look at the uh, answer. Most of you got that right. Uh, 32 uh, said it's a lack of communication between departments. Interesting, only two said lack of available budget. 
And uh, here's the result that came from uh, our survey. What are contact centers doing uh, right now? And um, it, it was indeed lack of communication between departments was the biggest uh, of the of the five uh, five barriers there. So, what percentage of contact centres have never mapped out the customer journey? Is it A four point eight percent, B fourteen point eight percent, C twenty four point eight percent, or D thirty four point eight percent? I'll give you a clue. The answer ends with point eight of a percent. So, uh, which uh, which uh, percentage have never mapped out the customer journey? Let's have a look at the uh, Results, most of you get that right. Uh, uh, a, about a third of our um, readers have never mapped out the customer journey and only a very small proportion have le uh, mapped it out in the, uh, in the, past, uh, in the past month. So we'll, uh, and last question. In 2019, which UK brand did which magazine highlight to be the worst for customer service? Was it BT, A, eh? was it B, Ryanair, was it C, Scottish Power, or D, Talk Talk? Uh, which brand was highlighted to be the worst for customer service? Let's have a look at uh, where things come, come through. And uh, indeed, most of you got uh, uh, Ryan Air right there, though I've got to say that none of the four did partic uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly well out of that. But uh, Ryan Air was concluded by, uh, uh, by uh, which? as being very poor at handling complaints and the most likely to be described as greedy or sneaky. So let's have a look at who won that. And the winner is Jeffrey. So we've got a prize coming out to uh, Jeffrey. Well, well, I've got another uh, question that's gonna come out. We asked that in the poll, but it'd be interesting to see results from the audience. So when did you last do your customer journey in your organization? Uh, was it in the past week? Was it in the past month? Was it in the past year? was it in the past five years or have you never done it in your organization so i think this would be quite uh, quite fascinating to see how it uh, how it ties in i think most of you have voted there and um yeah well it looks like it pretty well ties in with the polling that we introduced earlier so even though that was done i think best part of a year ago uh we've got uh, slightly less of you 32 percent have never done it so i think there's a a, a good exercise to go through there and uh, to bring in some uh, uh, to bring in some post-it notes uh, or indeed some specialist software to uh, do that we're just going to go off and take a couple of questions before we jump across to mike alex you said there were some questions about delivery of uh parcels correct yes so um i saw some people questioning how um a customer in four clicks can get a nice five thousand pound bottle of whiskey replaced so clearly that's the dream path so uh, every customer had a profile if you, if you, and the company that owns McAllen is Edgington, they also own the famous grouse, which you can buy for 18 pounds in Tesco. So if you were a famous grouse customer, you would not get a replacement bottle that easy. First thing we do is who is this customer? What profile are they? And this particular customer was someone when you spend half a million pounds on us a year, they're a big influencer. So we gave them the dream path, but it's like every, all the things I, I shared in 10 minutes were generic. Everything needs to be personalized to the customer. So uh, there's so much data in the world. It's used so rarely in the right way. This customer, their value, what's the context? And the context was just as important. This bottle of whiskey was for a, a wedding anniversary the day after next as well. So boom, just do it, you know? And, um, but that's, the, that's the, the perfect path. Most customers, if we didn't know anything about them, would have to send in the proof of purchase, they'd scan the QR code. So that you have to give the journey relevant to the situation. Indeed. So some great stuff there. So a quick uh, question for our panel before we jump onto Mike's presentation. Uh, how can we get stakeholder buy-in? All of this seems relatively sensible, but where the MD or the chief operating officer have no big interest due to other business priorities, it's hard to get this over the line. Uh, Annika, have you got any, uh, any thoughts on this? Um, yes, it's... Uh... It's a very common question and a very common challenge. Um, there's two things. One is um, making the case. Um, I see a lot of um, teams um, not building proper business cases, which is not that easy and always not that easy in customer experience management, but it is possible. And um, that's one 
part and being very systematic in stakeholder management. Um, it's not just talking to interest people, but being very systematic in analyzing who stands where, what are their topics, what are their goals. Um, and if, even if um, management doesn't have too much interest, there's always someone that has um, a passion or sees it. And then you can start small and then scale it from there. So it also doesn't always have to be the big program from the start. Indeed, wonderful. Well, we've uh, got to get into Mike's presentation. So Mike, if you'd like to uh, share your thoughts on uh, how technology can improve the customer journey. Jotty, yep. so just confirm that you can see my screen okay? Can indeed, yeah. Perfect, okay. <clears throat> so this has uh, been a really, really interesting webinar today. So uh, thank you everybody from the audience to the panelists for really good insights. And, and my role here really is to sort of think about technology in, in the context of customer journey. So I wanted to share some of the experiences that I've had with some of my customers. And um, I think you'll find it um, interesting. And if you like, um, I suppose for, for me, if you like, I like, you know, things that are simple, things that are elegant and kind of work well. And um, uh, for me, if you will, that, that, that's, that's a kind of a theme that's just worked for me in, in, in my career. And um, certainly what I would say is in the contact center area, uh, elegant and simple is just not, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a dream as, as, as Alex mentioned, but um, it can be realized. And when you do realize it, the benefits are extraordinary. So um, what I wanted to sort of, ask the audience to think about is in, in the context of customer journeys it's, it's this idea of aligning the the, the stakeholders um, wherever they sit across departments within the organization they have a role to play in that experience you know, delivered to the customer and from logistics to manufacturing to marketing uh, to say like every department in the organization has a role to play in customer journey just let's be clear and uh, certainly within our own organization of genesis we've had this notion of flying in formation just to actually validate and, and reinforce across our company, um, whether in your professional services or in support or in coding or in sales or in marketing, actually there is a purpose here and that is we have to align the company around the customer goals. And that's actually worked very well for us over a late 18 month program. And uh, it's something which I'd ask you to sort of think about because it's, it's, it's kind of worked from, from our perspective. But getting those stakeholders into a room or a virtual room and sort of getting them to buy into their sort of role in the customer journey, educating them on what, what, what their work is doing in the context of the journey, and then um, getting them to commit to making improvements, whether it's a you know, manufacturing issue, a logistics issue, you know, whatever the issues may be that's causing congestion in the contact center, getting the sort of ownership of that stakeholder to take, uh, be empowered and actually go and work on reducing the, the, the cause, shall we say. This has to be kind of a regular conversation. So it's not something which you can sort of flash into as a sort of a burst project and just kind of walk away after six weeks. Think of this as like a steady heartbeat that's kind of necessary to kind of work throughout the organization just forever really, because uh, things in the sort of context of the area never ever sort of stand still. And to that end, uh, healthy, I would say, brands who are kind of like on it, uh, like to kind of keep this sort of heartbeat going across the whole, the whole business. So, you know, if I, if I kind of come to a stakeholder meeting and I want to see improvement, and again, I've been let down by the, the marketing guys that did send out a, a major promotion last week and totally sort of floored the contact center unexpected traffic. Um, we have to sort of show these guys through good reporting that actually um, they are accountable and they need to sort of uh, step up. And, and the kind of problem with reporting, if you like, in the contact center is um, depending upon how you've sort of set things up, uh, depending upon how many systems you have that kind of creates your contact center, whether there are systems for voice or recording or workforce management or inbound or outbound, different systems for digital, often different systems for many parts of digital. So I've got some for chat, I've got some for email, I've got four different types of um, messaging sort of tools. You know, they're all very helpful, but actually they create lots and lots of disparate pieces of information about that journey. So it starts getting hard for you to sort of say, from a contact center perspective, this is the impact you're actually having on, on my operations because I've got to go to many sort of areas to try and knit together that, that, that vision. And, and, and the reporting, if you like, starts then to become quite, quite heavy lifting. And often I think people kind of give up, so they just don't bother. And therefore, um, to me, that's kind of failure. 
Um, but you really have to sort of drive into getting the right staff so you can take those to your meeting with your stakeholders and drive for them to take ownership and improvement. And, and, and often I kind of see departments which are just about gathering data, putting it into a right shape that the customer likes to see it, so the business likes to see, and then publishing it. And um, often I've seen those teams being like, you know, like double digit sized teams, which I find extraordinary and disappointing. Because um, from my perspective, if, if it's so hard to get the data into a shape to actually manage the business, then there's a sort of a source problem there with regards to the complexity of your operations. So from that point of view, think about that and really sort of try and figure a way to kind of get away from that sort of data congestion. And, and a, sort of a, a simple way, out, of course, I would say this, but a simple and straightforward way is to kind of invest in modern tech into your, into your contact center. And, and by doing that, you will find that all of those disparate systems that you have had in the past become consolidated into, into hopefully a, a, a single, single platform. The less individual components that you have in the contact center tech-wise, the more success you will have in getting the right data around which you can help your colleagues in the wider business to manage the overall customer journey. So from that point of view, I'm sort of showing you here all the interaction handling sort of types and capabilities that a modern contact center would have, and that's kind of helpful. Um, from that, then we can kind of put a uh, sort of a, a measure around the sort of the traffic, the interactions, and we can figure out how, if you like, um, we're, we're doing okay, or we're seeing your know, better take up on the messaging that, you know, like Alex mentioned, WhatsApp is quite popular. Absolutely, we kind of see that too, and making sure that just by adopting that, I'm not creating a a new sort of pocket of, of, of experts. We kind of need to spread these skills across the wider sort of contact center and not, not make sort of pockets of, um, uh, like I say, experts and sort of um, owners. Um, from our perspective and, and our thinking within Genesis, everybody should be capable. It's not necessarily a case where I have a, a digital team and a voice team. That again, for me, I think is a disappointing practice. So, so think about that if that's yours. But the other part of this notion of like an all-in-one technology is that it also encompasses what the, your, your, your colleagues are doing as advisors and agents. And we mentioned already how helpful things are like call and screen recording or you know, being able to kind of go back to this sort of conversations and understand what was the customer journey for that section. And remember, that's fine as a sort of a tool to get the customer journey for the time when you spoke to your customer. But guess what? There's been a whole lot of activity happening before the customer contacted you. There's been a whole lot of activity in the journey since the customer spoke to you that needs to be factored into your thinking about customer journey. So great that that was kind of a high measured sort of part, if you like, of the, of the analysis so far, but, but we really have to sort of think much wider when it comes to the journey because the whole experience is what matters, not just the piece. But going back to my point, this is all about the individual, so the, the advisor, helping the advisor to become stronger, better, empowering the advisor to have the right information at their fingertips every time so that they can actually feel empowered to sort of be an ambassador for the for the brand and, and not sort of feel intimidated by process where actually no no i just must say this or i must do that actually this customer is annoyed and i can help them and i can actually take ownership of this and make a decision and fix um a bit like annika suggested in in, in her slides but by having a single platform with a single source of information all of a sudden now I have this sort of notion of, of, of the bigger picture. And guess what, it's coming from a single database. And oh my God, that is so sort of refreshing, so liberating. Um, all of a sudden I can get the answers to the questions I need at the click of a finger. Whether it's how many bots were successful, whether it's how many outbound calls failed, how many callbacks did fulfill, for the appointments that we made with customers, how many showed up or how many did not show up, whether the same customer, those type of things. So those useful sort of helpful pieces of information suddenly become very easy to access and for you to take back into that sort of stakeholder meeting and say, look guys, you let me down again, fix it for next week or else we go to the CEO and have a conversation. And don't forget with, with modern tech, simple tech, you know, you can just sort of feed guys, you just know, feed the stakeholders, the dashboards they need, whether they like it or not. Okay, so when they log on in the morning, the first thing they see is what the impact that, that their sort of activities have had in the contact center yesterday. Um, and from that perspective, it just sort of keeps them in the, in the mind's eye that they've got a role to play. And guess what? The contact center is absolutely part of that, that role they need to think about. So, you know, again, just to sort of think about customer journeys, and we talked about the tools that we can use. And from our perspective, because you sort of start to think about this single system, this is kind of our customer journey tool. And uh, this is really cool because it actually allows me to sort of, in a single interface, you know, 
create, orchestrate, structure, modify, copy, paste, whatever, the whole sort of interaction that customer has, whichever interaction type it is, I don't care. But every sort of moment that customer spends within, if you like, the contact center tech, um, we have full you know, access to it measurement wise and sort of control wise. And that's, again, very powerful. And also it's kind of easy. So from that point of view, you don't need a bunch of people to kind of manage your, your contact centers, you need a couple. Um, and that, that's, kind of, that's kind of very helpful from an exp, you know, a journey point of view. The, um, the second part I'd like to say, sorry, John, did we just have a, a jump there? I can't move. Yeah, we're just uh, doing a quick uh, uh, poll of the audience if they'd like to see a demonstration of the uh, Genesis Pure Cloud uh, solution. I've just put that up on the screen. So some uh, great feedback there, Mike. Um, get the technology as elegant and uh, as simple as possible. Uh, figure out a way to get away from data congestion and don't give it up as too difficult. Uh, and give the advisor the right information they need to uh, uh, need to share. So uh, Mike, your concluding remarks? Yes, apologies, John, I, I, I missed the overrun on time, forgive me. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks for that, Mike. Uh, just we've got time for a couple of uh, a couple of opinions coming through. Robert says emotional in in experience needs to be the priority when reviewing the customer journey. We've got a couple of uh, couple of speed tips. Yeah, use your people to make suggestions on how to improve the journey. They're the ones who interact daily with your customers and be possess best positioned to provide some sparks of creativity. And collate reviews, e.g., trust pilot and regular feedback to the business listening is the best form of customer experience management. Uh, we've got uh, one question for Alex. Uh, should contact centers create a strategy starting with each customer question or issue type and designing the channels experience that will be available to address that specific topic? Absolutely, yes, I touched on that earlier. So the, the, if you think of Amazon, the first thing you have to do is choose your product and then what it is you wanna talk about. That's fairly simplistic, but in every example I gave, um, you want to return, what do you want to do? Do you want to return a bottle of whiskey? Do you want to inquire about a delivery? Do you want to change your billing address? You choose the category, then you offer the relevant channel options, but you have to overlay over that other thing. So is this a gold guest list British Airways customer? They can have whatever they want. Is this a blue level customer, who a business customer flying from Aberdeen to London in three weeks? Don't give them a callback request, just give them a channel that's relevant to the need. So you can actually, make these dynamic and as well if you have too many requests in one channel you can turn it on and off as well so you should never offer a channel that you're not ready to respond to wonderful well uh, that's uh, all we've got time for this week if you could put into the chat room what did you like best about today's webinar let's have a look for the uh, winning tip today uh, which is, comes in from robert map out your processes and overlay the customer touch points and then overlay their emotional state at each stage uh, this will highlight pain points in your process that is driving uh, customers' dissatisfaction. I think it's an excellent, uh, excellent feedback. If you could leave the uh, survey for us, we can look at our customer touch points. Will be great. We will have a replay available in about 45 minutes' time. Uh, we're back next week looking at capacity planning. But I'd like to say thank you to our speakers. What a lot of great content we've had today. Uh, Alex Mead, thank you for joining us today. Some great advice. Uh, Annika Bork, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And Mike, thanks for uh, joining us uh, again, which is great. Thanks uh, very much. Eight. Thanks very much. And we'll be back uh, next year, uh, so next year, next week, when we're going to be looking at capacity planning. Thanks, everyone, then. Bye bye. <laughs>